Hi everyone. Today I would talk about long term potentiation in details. One significant feature of our brain is its ability to change throughout its lifetime depending upon experiences. And our brain is composed of billions of neurons connected to each other by junctions known as synapses. And depending upon learning or memory related task or when we gain experiences the strength of the synapses change and the strength of the synapses could increase or decrease this alteration of the synaptic chain synaptic strength is known as synaptic plasticity and if the synaptic strength has increased the transmission efficiency of the synapse has increased over time then we can call it potentiation and some kind of potentiated synaptic response could last for even days to hours and that is termed as long-term potentiation in early 1960s Timothy Bliss and Tarje Lomo devised a protocol which can alter strength between the synapses but how did they measure the altered strength between the synapses they stimulated the presynapse and was able to record from the postsynapse. Now, when they injected a small amount of current in the presynaptic terminal, they found that from the postsynapse they could record the excitatory postsynaptic potential, which is EPSP, which is basically a voltage deflection. Now, they can give high frequency stimulation, and after high frequency stimulation, once they again applied the same amount of injected current, they are able to get uh, increased amplitude of the postsynaptic response. Suggesting synaptic strength has altered, it is increased, that's, that's why same amount of current can give rise to even bigger voltage deflections. Another way of understanding this uh, data is to calculate the slope of this EPSP. Now the slope would be increasing if the synaptic strength has increased can see here is a point when high frequency stimulus was given and after that the slope of the EPSP is way above than, than the normal situation. That means there is something inside a hidden message inside the high frequency stimulus that is allowing a long lasting change in synaptic strength. And you can see the synaptic strength alteration could last for even several hours. Now, what Timothy Bliss and Turgeon Lomo did, they took hippocampus from rabbits and they cut certain sections such that they can get a slice where they can record from the hippocampal region. And here is a kind of model setup that probably could be used to record from the uh, hippocampal slices. They stimulated the perforant pathway, which is coming from the entorenal cortex. And this perforant pathway, just posting up to this uh, perforant pathway, is dented gyrus granule cells. They placed their recording electrode to the dented gyrus granule cells and stimulated the perforant pathway. And they exactly used the protocol that I have discussed previously. They stimulated first, they were able to record. Then they give a 100 hertz high frequency stimulation for four to five times. And again, they injected small amount of current that they have injected earlier and each time they have observed that the EPSP slope has increased suggesting the synaptic strength is altered now the synaptic efficacy is increased synaptic transmission efficiency has increased and it's lasting for quite a lot of hours so this kind of change they have termed as long-term potentiation because it is long-lasting increase in synaptic strength. Now, their discovery at early 1960s created a huge impact on neuroscience field because at the same time people knew that hippocampus could be very important for formation of memory. From the patients who don't have hippocampus or lost their hippocampus during any kind of accidents has impaired memory or they, they, they fail to form new memories. That created a huge impact that time because people know hippocampus is important and at the same time 
Bliss and Lomo found that hippocampal strength, hippocampal synaptic strength could be altered by high frequency stimulus. People asked the question that whether high frequency, the LTP protocol that they used, whether it is the same kind of proto, same kind of mechanisms are used inside our brain to encode the memories. And indeed, these LTP protocol has good computational advantages, like it has input specificity. That means the synapse which is stimulated with high frequency stimulus is only getting potentiated. Only the synaptic strength is altered, which is selectively stimulated, not the other one. And cooperativity means potentiation in one synapse would, would increase the chance of potentiation in the nearby synapses. That means they, there is some degree of crosstalk. So all these properties are attractive properties which could be used by our brain to encode memories. Later, people found that certain learning tasks where a mouse has to go to a box and where they are given a shock. So this kind of conditioning is known as inhibitory avoidance uh, conditioning where the mouse would learn to avoid this kind of chamber. So underlying this kind of behavioral task, people found a long-lasting change in the synaptic strength, suggesting LTP-like phenomena is also valid underlying mechanism of learning or, uh, or experience-related behaviors. That means this particular mechanism could be used, the mechanism, the molecular mechanisms underlying LTP could be used by our brain to encode or to store memories. Now, what is so magical about this high frequency stimulation? What hidden message does it have that is read by the cells to write plastic changes? Well, one of the very interesting fact about LTP is it is dependent upon NMD receptor and coincidence detection. Let me describe what is coincidence detection and what is the role of NMD receptor in it. Now, when a presynaptic action potential reach its terminal, it would allow vesicle release and let's say it's a glutamatergic synapse and the neurotransmitter is glutamate. So glutamate would bind to the glutamate receptors. One type of glutamate receptor is AMPA receptor, other type is NMDA. Both are ionotropic. That means they are ligand gated ion channels. But NMDA receptor doesn't open when glutamate is bound to it because there is a magnesium block in the intracellular side. Now AMPA, AMPA conducts sodium which would in turn make the postsynaptic membrane more depolarized, repelling the magnesium block out. Now the NMD receptor can conduct and it could allow calcium influx. So what NMD receptor does is NMD receptor convey the message about coincidence. It tells the synapse that presynapse and postsynapse are simultaneously active. The presynaptic activity status is conv conveyed by the presynaptic glutamate receptor binding, glut glutamate binding to the NMD receptor, and the postsynaptic uh, postsynaptic magnesium block repelling conveys the message about postsynaptic activity status. So presynaptic and postsynaptic activity is coupled at the level of molecules such as NMDA, and that gives rise to coincidence. Now, if you block NMD receptor the principal path by which coincidence detection can happen, then people have found that the potentiated response after a high frequency stimulus is gone. In a control situation where NMD receptor is active and there is no blocker, after high frequency stimulation there is potentiated response and it is expressed in terms of percentage of baseline slope. But in case of NMD receptor, when the NMD receptor is blocked by pharmacological agent, the potentiation is gone. But people have also found that, that the animal in which the NMD receptor was blocked by systemic injection of pharmacological agent with, which block NMD receptor, there also the mouse poorly performed in spatial navigation task in Morris water maze. Now, Clearly, we understand that NMD receptor and NMD receptor mediated calcium influx is very important for change in synaptic strength, for change in long-lasting synaptic strength. So what is inside the calcium dynamics? 
what messages does calcium has which can translate to functional change or which can alter the synaptic efficacy it turns out that the calcium spatiotemporal dynamics can hold specific information that information could be in turn decoded by molecular players like CAMK2 or RAS and etc. So in this video I would talk about a little bit about CAMK2 but before we go there we should understand whether calcium elevation is at all necessary for long-term potentiation or not. People early research has shown that when people stimulated the perforant path they can record from the granule cells and in normal situation people can find, find a potentiated response but when they block calcium in the post synapse by putting a calcium chelator they, they found no potentiation happens suggesting calcium is important postsynaptic calcium elevation is important for long-term potentiation now in order to show that this is sufficient people have given un uh, uncaged people have uncaged caged calcium in the postsynaptic region now after uncaging of the calcium in the postsynapse has increased the synaptic strength that means calcium is both necessary and sufficient for long term potentiation now what we saw is if we inject a current from the postsynapse we are going to record a response now here we give a 100 hertz high frequency stimulus repeatedly for four times now what molecular phenomena happens underlying this 100 hertz frequ high frequency protocol so after high frequency stimulus you are going to get a potentiated response because in a calcium and cam kinase dependent manner lot of ampa mediated vesicles are going to dock onto the postsynaptic membrane which would allow more and more ampa receptor to be displayed on the postsynaptic membrane which would hugely increase the ampa currents and increase the probability that NMDA mediated calcium could easily get in and thereby altering the synaptic transmission efficiency now you can clearly understand after a 100 hertz frequency protocol the the strength of the synapse has altered because a lot more ampere receptors are on the surface and you can record a boosted postsynaptic current or postsynaptic potential the researchers have shown that after after LTP protocol there is a increase in volume and also there is an in increase in postsynaptic current and this increase is restricted to the spine that is stimulated that means restricted to the synapse which undergoes a high frequency uh, stimulus but nearby spines which doesn't undergo high frequency stimulus doesn't show any potentiated response this also suggests and proves that long-term potentiation is input specific now people found that underlying calcium the CAMK2 activity is very important for truly important for plastic changes now people can selectively stimulate with, with advancement of new technologies people can selectively stimulate synapses and can monitor CAMK2 activity in real time by fluorescence resonance energy transfer now what people have found that CAMK2 activity lasts for a few seconds roughly about 60 seconds and after, just after CAMK2 activity there is a correlated increase in synaptic volume that suggests CAMK2 activity can functionally and structurally alter the synapses and CAMK2 activity is downstream to calcium and high frequency stimulus so again see here is the high frequency stimulation and after the high frequency stimulation when we give the initial uh, current injection what we have used earlier there is now neurotransmitter release from the presynapse and now the neurotransmitter can bind to even more glutamate receptors than earlier it would allow sodium to influx and it is now easy to make the postsynapse depolarized and thereby repelling the magnesium block and thereby allowing calcium to influx so for this region for, for, for this particular reason what we saw 
is there is an increased postsynaptic potential or postsynaptic current because now there are more channels getting inserted into the membrane also that i haven't discussed is cam k2 can phosphorylate specific amp receptor and thereby greatly enhancing their conduction efficiency now more amount of sodium can come in from those amp receptors which are phosphorylated which is another mechanism of uh, ltp now how to understand that more and more amp receptors are inserted into the postsynaptic membrane so what people do does is people uh, stimulate the presynapse uh, able to record from the postsynapse and they calculate something called amp by nmd ratio now after high frequency stimulation what people have found that amp by nmd ratio has increased that means more amp receptors are inserted which would make it easier to activate the nmd receptors and thereby conducting calcium through nmd receptors now not only so we also we, we found that that uh, high frequency stimulus and downstream to high frequency stimulus calcium cam k2 all these can change the functional properties of the synapse can change the transmission efficiency of the synapse but it's also true that synaptic volume is also increased after high frequency stimulus let's just see what what possibly could happen uh, underlying high frequency stimulus scientists has found out that just like cam k2 activity another small rho gtps activity ctc42 is restricted to dendritic spine and cam k2 can phosphorylate ctc42 and ctc42 is well known to regulate arp 23 activity and thus ctc42 can regulate actin branching actin polymerization etc etc which could ultimately allow to increase in spine volume thereby we can understand that how long term potentiation can give rise to functional and structural changes at the level of synapse how calcium is important in this process and how nmd receptor can detect coincidence and thereby greatly enhance synaptic strengths but the question that it's really really an open question in the uh, neuro uh, in neuroscience is whether ltp is memory or not people found good correlations and good computational properties of ltp which 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 could uh, make ltp as an attractive model of memory encoding but still people believe that high frequency stimulus is too high for a physiological situation let's say we when we taste an ice cream we still remember the taste of the ice cream still now but does that ice cream give rise to that high frequency stimulus people really don't know so there are also contradictory views against ltp so but still people believe that the molecular mechanisms underlying ltp could be used by our brain to encode memories hope you enjoyed my video so if you like my video give it a quick thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe and if you if possible please share thank you thanks for watching